going live right now. All right. So without further ado, uh, because we jam packed the schedule with literally so much content because we had so many awesome people who wanted to be part of it. So no regrets there. You don't have to listen to me talking for long. I would like to go into a panel discussion that uh, yeah, I'm very, very excited about. And the, so the first thing we should do is probably give people an opportunity to introduce themselves. We're going to keep our intros pretty short so that we can uh, talk about stuff. So I'll start down the line. Uh, Dawn, go. Hi, I'm Dawn Parsik. I'm a developer advocate at LaunchDarkly, and I'm based in Seattle, Washington. Pacific Northwest. Woot, woot. Drew, go. Yeah, hey everyone, Drew Horn here, Director of Business Development at Sumo Logic, uh, based out of Austin, Texas. Austin. Okay, next right. is Constance. Hi everyone, I'm Constance Caramelis. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Splunk, and I am based out of SF. Heck yeah. Now we're on to Brian. You may know him. Hello, I'm Brian Lyles. Um, I'm a software engineer at VMware, and I'm based out of Washington, D.C. Oh, I didn't even know that. Learn something new every day. Okay, next, Claire. Hey, I'm Claire Ligori. I'm a principal engineer at AWS and I'm based out of the Seattle area. Superstars on the call. All right, so first thing I wanna talk about is something I'm obsessed with, psychological safety. Amy Edmondson coined the term psychological safety in 1999. It's gotten some lip service, especially since Google published the rework study a few years ago and found psychological safety to be a foundational dynamic in successful teams. So what I want to ask is why does why does psychological safety matter in software development? And first on that question, I wanted to talk, talk to Dawn because Dawn has a master's in psychology uh, as well as a lot of experience in, in software. So over to you, Dawn. All right, thanks. Hey. Uh, part of the psychological safety is being having it be okay to make a mistake. If you're going to move fast, if you're going to deploy every day, mistakes are going to be made, and you don't want to be like having everyone point fingers and blame and shame. So that psychological safety is something that makes it okay to take a risk, and knowing that if something goes wrong, your job isn't going to be on the line. Now, that's not saying you can go and do something over the top and still have a job. There is a line there that you don't want to cross, but um, everyday mistakes shouldn't result in like panic and dread. And I, I think that's simply put, and that's nice. Anyone, by the way, we're doing a, a hand raising thing with hands. So put your hand up if you want to talk and I will call on you. Yeah, Brian, I was going to call on you because I know you lead engineering teams, right? So. What, what do you have to say? Yeah, else? yeah. so I am in tech leadership at VMware, uh, highest black employee in the whole entire 31,000 person company will go me. Um, I do a lot of mentoring and it's actually uh, it's interesting that Don said that we talk a lot about psychological safety and what I tell engineers, I tell them something very simple. Uh, you're gonna fall and, it, and you're gonna fail now. Do you want an organization that knows you're going to fall and buffers it or catches you? Or do you want an organization that uh, lets you fall and laugh at you? And then also, how can you change your organization to catch other people? And it's something very important that I tell engineers all the time. Well said. Yeah. Do you want it? That's at the end of the day, that's the question, right? That we we're all asking. Anyone else? I'm looking at, I'm looking for the hands. Claire, go Claire. So I think um, I think the point about you know not losing your job if you if you make a mistake is so important and um, I think from the sort of once you've made that mistake it's really important about how your your organization reacts to that right so one of the things that we do we build a lot of tools around this around um, sort of post mortem analysis right and so it's important to um, to focus on the process instead of the person that that um, was impacted by a lack of process or a lack of guardrails, basically. And so um, we have a process, we, we use the term bar raiser a lot to in different areas um, to basically a set of people who are really, um, really high judgment about this, really experienced about this. And so one of the things we have is um, effectively postmortem bar raisers who are responsible for making sure that, you know, we're not blaming the person, we don't name the person, we always say, 
and the engineer followed these steps um, and these steps were were wrong and we need to fix these steps so that um, somebody else doesn't doesn't um, fall into the same mistakes. Yeah, and this is a bad time to flip through Accelerate and look for the quote that uh, says what you're talking about. I think you, pr you proved that out. Go ahead, Constance. Yeah, I actually think exactly to your point, right? It's like, it ends up at least like when mistakes happen, it's like, what question do you ask? And it's always, I think the healthier way to ask it is like, how did we fail together? Instead of making it very individual, it's like, how did the tools that we provided, you know, to the team and how we observed things, how did that fail us, right? And at least putting the onus on terms of like how the process and how we do engineering and how we roll things out, like analyzing what were the gaps there and not saying it's a person or, you know, yeah, pretty much don't blame it on individuals. So I want to dig into that a, a little bit more. You, you both talked about tools and kind of how tools can support psychological safety for developers or tools are part of the puzzle when you're doing a doing an analysis. So how can tools help us support psychological safety? Uh, what what do you go ahead, Brian? Yeah, so tools are interesting and there's good and bad. Um, the good is that tools don't have feelings and garbage in, same garbage to come out on the other side. Um, the bad part about tools is if they're programmed wrong, garbage goes in and, and really bad stuff comes out of it other side, but we should use tools to promote fairness and to promote the ability to do things over and over again at the at the same way. Because us as humans, we'll decide that we want to change it and we will change it even subconsciously. I'm sure Don knows that pretty well. But um, I'm not even I'm I'm not a I'm not a psychologist and I don't understand the brain, but I even I know that um, I change how I do things if I do it more than once. So tools help us not do that. Yeah. And I mean, one thing that brings us all here is automation. And what you're what you're pointing out is that's like the first step to getting to automation is like getting to the point where you can do it, know how to do it the same way every time. You can't have automation without that. So it's almost like that process is part of the discovery process that leads us to be able to automate, maybe. Kind of what I'm thinking. Any other thoughts on this before I move on to another? Oh, go ahead, Drew. Yeah, um, so what I was going to say is one of, one of my prior jobs focus was uh, physical safety. We had a um, we had a, an, an executive there uh, th throw a chair across the room. And so that was that was an interesting situation. But before, um, you know, before that term kind of was being used in the circles that, that I was running in, some of the other like terms that we would use, you know, trust, empathy, shared ownership through collaboration, and definitely blameless culture. Um, you know, talking to a lot of the really mature teams out there that have all of these tools in place definitely made them made it easier for them to focus more on the cultural aspect. But I would say maybe in consulting some teams that are kind of working more towards um, starting to build out those DevOps capabilities, a really good, um, you know, recommendation and thing that I saw that helped them was focusing on even just collecting the data and like democratizing data across teams so that, um, you know, when you do go into one of those sessions, you know, where you're doing a postmortem, you actually have the data at hand and it's, and it's not a subjective conversation. So. That's a good point. Yeah. That what data you have really, really shapes the, the agency that folks have to be part of the conversation. It's a good point. And there was one other thing I wanted to, I forgot about it. I wanted to ask if that came up in our pre-call, uh, Constance, you had an interesting thought on how does fear factor into software delivery, right? And maybe you can talk a little bit about the relationship between fear and psychological safety and what your thoughts are on that. Oh, actually, Dawn had her hand up. I don't know if she wants to finish oh, what you were just saying. Yeah. See, I said I was doing it and then I didn't do it. Go ahead, it's Dawn, okay. and then and then you're cued, Constance. <laughs> Thanks, Constance. I wanted to address the the tools piece. Part of psychological safety and making mistakes is learning from those mistakes. And having tools can help you learn things that you didn't know about your applications, whether it's observability tools, alerting tools, running experiments, uh, all of those things are, we rely on our tools to kind of help us with that. And that gives us the knowledge to learn more and 
uh, dig deeper into what's going on within our applications. Yeah, totally. And I thinking about that from the perspective of Spinnaker, people use Spinnaker so that the wider business can actually learn, can do A-B testing or, or do feature testing of different features. So it's almost like if you have a safe culture for software to to move fast in that way, then that opens the door for software to become the tool that helps your whole business learn how to do better, faster. So sort of like a domino effect, I think. Constance? Right. Or anything else, Don? Um, yeah, so the thing that I had brought up during our like pre-talk was that I think there is a little bit of a healthy amount of fear, I guess, like kind of like maybe if we make a parallel to like children, right, like on a play park, like, they, or, you know, a playground, like they know they shouldn't jump off the slide, like, you know, like a little bit healthy amount of fear and making that parallel where sometimes at least, and maybe, and I guess they kind of wanted to like, so the where I think it's good to phrase a little bit, like when you're deploying something like, you know, like assessing the risk, like, do I actually understand the risk? What are the potential impacts? And that's kind of more what I went mean about fear is at least like if you if you don't know those things maybe you shouldn't be deploying right or like maybe or you should be testing things out within a safe environment and so at least understanding what are the potential negative impact uh, repercussions of deployment and then helping you assess that because sometimes just being a cowboy isn't really fun for everyone around as much fun as it can be sometimes in the moment absolutely and you use the word safe. So I want to dig into that a little bit because that's something also we talk about a lot at Armory and a lot with Spinnaker. What does safety even mean when it comes to software delivery? I know Claire had some thoughts on this. Uh, she thinks a lot about, you know, being really safe without slowing down devs. Constance, also want to hear your thoughts. So go. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, when you talk about safety versus speed, often what I hear people talking about speed is, getting something fully um, fully delivered to production. And so they really work on, you know, how can we make our pipelines finish in five minutes or an hour? Um, and we tend to think about it a little bit differently. We think about, um, you know, trading off developer productivity with the speed of the pipeline and safety. And effectively it goes back to, to risk is what Constance was saying around, you know, what is, what is the risk that we're having around speeding up, um, speeding up deployments? And so typically what we do, our pipelines actually take um, at least a week, typically across different AWS service teams, sometimes up to, to two weeks. And that sounds really slow, um, but one of the things we do is that it, it's pretty fast to get to production. And then there's this very slow progressive delivery in production because we don't want to have this massive blast radius of deploying everywhere within five minutes. Um, but on the developer productivity side, they don't have to sit there and watch the pipeline for, for two weeks. Um, often when I talk to, to, to customers who are trying to implement continuous deployment, um, they have their developers for every automated deployment sitting there watching the dashboard, They're like waiting to click that rollback button. Um, and we don't want developers doing that, right? We want them to kind of honestly forget about it, um, push their code and forget about it and let the pipeline take care of it. Um, but, so we have to put those safety mechanisms in place, like very slow rollout in production. Even if it gets to production within, you know, an hour, it's really um, it's really safe once it gets into production because it's so slow and it's automatically rolling back. I'm gonna give it some time to call the next person. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Right. So that's an interesting place that we get into that. When you, um, I, I wouldn't say it's the problem that your engineers are looking at their CD deployment and uh, deployment dashboards, waiting for things to come out, or or even their uh, CI dashboards. Uh, I think it's because uh, we we miss more work in trusting the system. Mm -hmm. You should know after a while that if your build breaks or your delivery is is somehow um, it fails some kind of check, that it just does the right thing. But we don't trust our tools. So we go and we look at it and we, we get real close to the screen and we stare at it. And I think whenever we're addressing whatever this cause is, it's not looking at your dashboards. Be happy you have them. Try to address the other thing that is the unspoken thing of why they actually do that. Maybe it's um, psychological. Um, maybe they get yelled at if they don't. Or maybe it's they don't trust the whole system. So something to think about. 
That's a, that's a really good point. It ties really nicely back to. Drew, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, having gone through and, and worked with other uh, teams who have gone through, you know, setting up continuous delivery and moving into continuous deployment, you know, I've seen a lot of people where there's concern about making that kind of final leap. And after you, after you do and give yourself the ability to get code quickly out the door and, and quickly roll back or roll forward um, and, and get that continuous feedback from, from what's happening. Um, it's amazing how much anxiety it actually reduces, like um, kind of opening the floodgate like that. Um, so especially for me, um, you know, there had some hesitancy, hesitancy in doing that the first time, but um, after, after getting in that situation is actually a relief, so. So we're, we're talking around, we're talking around a little bit about um, like that, that trade off between the speed of delivering new features and then kind of, oh, are you, did you raise your hand, Constance? No. Oh. And then I was all excited about what you had to say um, ab about so, so sort of like that the trade off um, and safety and compliance is on the other side of that trade off. And the, the tricky thing about safety and compliance I've seen is that, and I think I said this earlier on another uh, chat, is like, Every SDLC is a snowflake. Like every company has its own very specific requirements, its own regulatory uh, con constraints, um, and in their own values that they have to that they want to serve out in their own business purposes. So, is it possible for all organizations to be both fast and safe? Kind of want to talk about that. And like, can you talk about any features or or pro projects that you've worked on that specifically? give people that ability or enhance that ability to allow any organization, even if it's snowflakey, to address those security and, and compliance requirements? Long question. Brian, spotlight on Brian. Yeah, so you know what? I'm going to be the first person to say that if you have that, why are you on this call? You should be out counting all the money that you made last week. Uh, no one has that. <laughs> But what, there is something you can have. And uh, we've learned throughout the years uh, the value of frameworks. And there is, it is possible to create a framework that allows you to scale up this type of practice within a small company, something on your desktop, to something going to maybe you're deploying to Azure because they're not represented here. So I want to talk about them. Or maybe you have your own private cloud running on, um, on your own local hardware. But when it comes down to it, there is actually a, a small framework you can put in place. Um, I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to toot my own horn. This is something I actually, I'm an R&D engineer at VMware, and half my job is spent on research. And what I've been researching is this theory that we can break down delivery into three things. And this is crazy because I've never talked about it before. But you have basically the state. And then you have, that's, that's what you want to deploy. What is it? It doesn't matter. It's just the state. And the state has a resolver, and it resolves to something. And then you have an invoker. And what does that come from? Well, somebody wanted to deploy. They pushed a button, or a time happened, or a, or a commit in a repository. And then you have a reconciler that takes that state and pushes it to where it needs to be. And if we can start building from first principles, instead of just saying we're going to have Spinnaker, or we're going to have drone or we're going to have something else if we actually solve the problem without our technology and our tools um i think it'll be better and i think what really what i'm saying is that as humans we love to solve problem with tools we know rather than defining the problem at, at a generic way and then applying what we know to it or inventing it or buying it and if we did it that way we probably could find solutions that work from you know your two-person startup to a company the size of, of amazon just a thought Love it and want to join that open source project. Any other thoughts on that? I'll go. I think um, I think I'm echoing Brian a little bit here around. Um, I think it's it's not just tools. You have to pair the tools with um, a people process, with a with a judgment process. So um, one of the things that that we do is um, you know we have have a lot of pipelines at Amazon, and so. One of the things we look at sort of across the company is a group of people actually sits down and looks at 
um, every postmortem across the company related to a deployment and says, what, what do we think is the sort of generic root cause here? Was it a lack of canary monitoring? Was it a lack of, um, of integration tests before production? Or was it a lack of a, a canary deployment? Um, and we start to see those trends across the company and then we can start to look at, okay, what are the things we wanna build that these teams need to sort of prevent some of these, these issues? And so um, sort of all that to say, I think it's important to, um, to um, you know, start from sort of human judgment about what's going on um, instead of just kind of building tools for building tools. Um, and I will do a, a little bit of a plug um, to, today on the Amazon Builders Library, which is a website where we put together what our internal processes are. Um, an article that I wrote about how exactly we do pipelines and what are all of those things that we identified that we needed in our pipelines and automation um, landed on the site today. I got it published just in time, so it's good. Um, so I'll, I'll share the link if I can. Yeah, go ahead and share it in the chat session. And then Drew, you, did you have some thoughts? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, I've worked with some really brilliant product owners in the past and uh, just, you know, been really lucky to do that. And um, I just, I, I love the, the thought process that they go through when it comes to building uh, software uh, and breaking down the problem before you, before you even start looking at tools. And so I just, when it comes to, you know, building pipelines or infrastructure as code, um, I'm always just trying to put my my product hat on uh, before jumping into tools, and I think that really helps, um, you know, give me the right type of insight as to you know when when that tooling decision comes, right? Um, you know, it's I'm not taking a step necessarily in in, in the wrong direction. So, good thoughts. Okay, I think Brian touched on this a little bit with his uh, framework teaser. Um, but I, I do want to know what what folks on this call, what do you think is still missing in software development and delivery workflow automation? Uh, what advancements are you looking forward to or seeing or driving right now? And I think, Drew, you had an answer on this. Uh, you wanted to talk yeah, to us a I little mean, bit about your continuous intelligence platform, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll move we'll move the shameless plugs around around the table. Uh, no, this is actually why I joined Sumo Logic. So um, I'm really interested in making it easier uh, to benchmark software delivery performance and provide teams and even at the organizational level um, with real time like actionable insights that they need to continuously improve and optimize on how they deliver software. Um, the reason why I joined Sumo is uh, in trying to do some of that work in the past, right? It's, it's really difficult, not only because um, you know, you have a day job in trying to do what you need to do um, and, you know, going off and trying to build that as a, you know, as a side project. But um, it's just the amount of tools and technologies uh, that have kind of made their way into the development and delivery pipeline has made it challenge to derive some of the, the key metrics that, um, you know, some of the industry accepted key metrics uh, needed to help kind of benchmark performance and and give teams the insights they need on uh, the data driven insights right on where they need to to focus to to improve. Um, so correlating that type of data across all of those tools is a challenge, and so that's what that's what we're really focused on. Um, especially me, that's what I'm really focused on here at Sumo Logic is being able to provide teams the ability to. Um, you know, set up a dashboarding just, you know, in minutes, like have a really easy out of the box experience where they can, you know, whether they have, whether they have Jenkins or whether they have Bitbucket pipeline or whether they have, you know, GitLab or GitHub, it doesn't matter what the tool is. You bring your, you bring your tools together and um, plug them in and, and ingest them into to Sumo logic. And we automatically take those logs, correlate data across all of those separate tools and bring them together just in an easy way to help uh, delivery teams understand where they sit. And then, you know, again, like, like all anal analytics platforms, right, provide the underlying logs to give them that feedback uh, to focus, to help them focus on where to improve. Sounds really exciting. And oh, go ahead, Constance. Definitely something we're interested in integrating into Spinnaker. And we're going to talk to Splunk team about, uh, talk to the Sumo Logic team about plugins. Go ahead, Constance. Yep. I had Splunk on the brain. Um, no, well, I guess, right, that's where, um, but so I guess 
you're kind of bringing up like the data aspect of it. And then after I think that, and also a little bit more to what like Brian was saying is that like, you know, like, you know, going back to first principles is that how, and I think this may be how I interpret what you're saying there is like how we ask the question shapes the answer. And we're so used to, you know, like saying like, okay, well, this is my media problem and this is how I'm going to fix it because these tools exist. And actually I see that a lot in terms of how people are gathering data is like, um, I'm actually a really big fan of tracing and I think that tracing should be actually like the first class, like in terms of gathering, you know, data around things. Um, whole, I can spend hours talking about that. Um, but then we, I feel like a lot of people end up getting so stuck in terms of like, oh, I'm going to make this a metric or a log. And they're forgetting to ask themselves, like, what am I actually trying to pay attention to? And like, how do I connect these things here? And then after like trying to find, there's some really cool ways you can tra connect traces and metrics and logs, all of that together. And like that can actually give you a much richer thing. And so it's just another deep dive in terms of like, what data do you actually want to, like, what questions are you actually trying to answer? Right, like, is it success rate? Probably not, right? Because success rate is good in terms of telling you something's up or down, but like, you probably care more about like, hey, can my, you know, customers actually buy something? Can my customers, you know, you know, go to this page thing here? And then after changing a little bit of how we do that measurement. So, I don't know. the data matters. It just you have to make sure you're asking the right questions beforehand. Be be intentional about it. Is what I'm hearing. Yes. Yeah. And actually, okay. So on that note, if this next question makes you uncomfortable. That's a very common response. I can relate, and I've recently been learning more about this phenomenon. There's a term called for it, and it's called white fragility. I'd like to bring it up. Also, that's a great book title to uh, check out. But if we can look beyond, I know we talk about the pipeline problem. That's something that happens a lot. Or offering to mentor people of, of color. Um, let's move beyond that. I want to talk to you about how should we, as technologists, really use our influence to support anti-racism and be part of making social justice a reality? I know it's on our minds today. I want to hear what you have to say. And I have stuff to say, if you, yeah. Dawn, anyone? I, I'll, I'll, I was going to give Brian raise his hand, so he can go first. You can okay. think All while right. Brian's talking. So <laughs> you asked. How do we make social justice a reality? Uh, I, I would actually put out there that um, as a you know as a black man in America, I don't know, and I'd be 44 in I don't know um, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. And in all 44 of my years, um, I've seen this is the last couple of weeks have not even been bad for me. There's definitely been worse weeks. Um, I'm glad to see this. But how do we make, how do we actually make this a real thing? Well, what we need to understand is that you need empathy. It's not that I don't want anyone feeling sorry for me that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having black problems this week. Really what I want people to understand is that the fact that I am having black problems this week means that you're having black problems too. And for us all to be better, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone and, and fix whatever you can. And you can't fix everything because you can't, but you can affect something. And don't excuse your racist relatives. That doesn't make me feel any better when you tell me you have a racist uncle because you still go hang out with them at Thanksgiving. So I just wanted to leave that. No, thank you for that. And I, I like what you said. I think when I thought about my answer to this question, it's like, my answer is, I don't know. And there are reasons for that. And I can I can say more, but I want to let uh, let Constance go because she had her hand raised and then Dawn's on the line too. Or Dawn, do you want to go first? Because you said you were going to think about it or? Sure. I'll, okay. Um, it, it may seem small, but like when I give presentations, I do a lot of effort to make sure that the pictures and the photos that I'm displaying are diverse and representative. If you do like a Google image search or use Unsplash or like whatever it is that you use for images, generally speaking, the majority of images that show up are white people. You have to work harder to find not something on the first page, like dig deeper to have a little bit of representation um, so that when you're speaking to people, they say like, oh, like I can see myself um, in those screens. And it may not be a big thing, but it's like a small step towards something else. Yeah, and taking those small steps is really important. Constance? Yeah, and I think maybe it's also the thing that needs to be, I guess, like I need to remind myself and then for everyone that comes from a position of privilege is that it is actually our problem and we can't just defer. Like it's such a lazy point 
to do because it's like, well, I'm not affected by it. It's like, no, but like, what about like, we're in a society and we're supposed to actually care about everyone, like, you know, caring about everyone does make our society better. And so like, if there are, there's a large, there's a large percentage of our society that is negatively impacted by the rules that we live by, then that means it's not working and that actually it isn't a proper society. And so we're all responsible for it and we can't keep on deferring. Yeah, everyone need we to go def- vote if you can. When we defer and when we ignore, what we're doing is asking people who are suffering from those black problems to suffer alone. And that's really a uh, crappy, like suffering with a problem that no one tries to understand is like one of the worst things. So uh, don't don't leave those people in the dark. Let's make this part of the conversation. Make it make it okay to talk about it on your team because that's what makes your team a psychologically safe place to be black or to be you. And I think that's really important. And once we have more people at the table, then maybe we can answer that first question of like, what does the solution actually look like? Once we have a, a better group to that can actually come up with good ideas, then I think we'll be in a much better place. I also uh, think one really quick example, it's like, you know, when people are asking like, oh, let's improve our diversity numbers. And just like, they're only thinking about women. It's like, oh, ask the woman to come up with ideas. It's like, come on, dudes. Like, come on, like everyone, like we're all responsible for this. Like, it's not meant to be deferred to the person who's already in that position because they already have a lot of work to do. Totally. All right. So this was a great talk. Thank you all for, oh, Claire, did you want to chime in? Go ahead. I think, um, I think you used the word intentional earlier and I think that's, that's exactly right. We have to be intentional about it um, and take time out to educate ourselves about it, about what we can do, what we can try. Um, So actually tomorrow with Juneteenth, I think that's a really great, great time to take, take time out, cancel some meetings and, and go, Go read a book, watch a documentary, things like that. We're actually doing that across Amazon tomorrow, which is um, it's wild. We're having a full day of you know no meetings. Go educate yourself, learn, take a workshop, things like that. So I think that's it's a great way to just you know take some time to do it, schedule it. Yeah, that's a really great point. And also, PSA: Dear White People doesn't count because it's too good. So you can watch that on your off hours and read a book during that time. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And there was one question that came up in the chat that I would like you to tweet about with the hashtag spin a girl live panelists. So someone asks safety is good and all, but do you have any tips for actually getting leadership to invest in it and pay attention to it. So uh, that question is has been wiped but it's it's up there and if you have tips for our listeners on how to get their leadership to invest in safety, please share because we want to keep this conversation going. Thank you all so much. I got this awesome team here. I'm going to give you a round of applause, which probably going to sound really disgusting coming out of my mic. I love you all. Come back and join us in the Spinnaker community anytime you want. All right. Thanks, everyone.